There are epic tales throughout all stories people share with each other, legends and classics such as Beowulf, the Odyssey, and more contemporarily, the Lord of the Rings. Of course, there are many more, but one I believe that stands highly among the must-read epics of all time is The Sandman, created by Neil Gaiman, Sam Keith, and Mike Dringenberg. People will often foolishly say that comic books are not true literature and that they're meant for children. And while that may be true for a small, small degree, there's a lot of books that break that stigma. And I would encourage anyone who lives by that statement to read The Sandman. What they will find is a story of great complexity for a mature audience not because of the inclusion of gore, sex, and violence, but because the characters exist in a realm that takes life experience to understand. To briefly explain the series, it's about Dream of the Endless. The Endless are seven siblings that each embody different endless elements of existence. We will get into that in a second. But Dream is captured by cultists who have attempted to capture death as a way to live forever. Dream is taken captive for decades before finally making it out and escaping. He then finds that the Dream Realm has crumbled and fallen to shambles in his absence, so he has to repair it. Over the course of the series, he is faced with having to change his ways or perish. And by the end, he makes a choice. If it isn't clear by now, I invested pretty heavily in the Sandman series for a lot of different reasons and it had such a positive impact on me that I want to share with you 10 reasons why I love the Sandman. And to note this video in particular is less of a review and more of a celebration of the whole series. Also, I'm not going to go over everything in super heavy detail, but if you do get confused, there is a video listed down below that serves as a really good introduction to the series. But also, you could just read it because it's really good and it comes across way more easy to understand than what anyone can really explain or tell you. So The first thing I want to talk about is the family. Remember when I mentioned that Dream had siblings? There's a lot here so I'm going to cover it quickly, but know that what I love about them is that they get along like real, actual siblings and all archetypes are here. Destiny, Death, Dream, Destruction, Desire, Despair, and Delirium, formerly known as Delight, each have such distinct personalities and when you see how they all interact with each other, you get a sense that they are really a family. Some parts of that family are a little bit more dysfunctional than others, but still, they're a family. Throughout the series, we get to explore their past and history and really get a sense of not only how the characters feel towards each other, but also who the characters are at their core and what they value. So I am actually fairly certain that Neo Gaiman has a lot of experience with family because this is exactly what it's like to have siblings. Personally, Destruction and Delirium are my absolute favorites. I love that Destruction neglects his responsibilities to make poetry and create art, and Delirium is a little ball of adorable, and what the heck did she just say? Another thing that is striking about the series is how they utilize all kinds of artists after the first couple of volumes to tell different stories. They clearly examined tons of artwork and meticulously chose the right artist and style for the different story arcs. Some art took me a little while to get used to, but after and while reading, it makes sense why they chose that artist to do that story. Every artist brings something new to the series, and it comes together so perfectly that doing it any other way would actually take away quite a bit of the experience from the book. For the most part, this is its own story and doesn't really connect with anything to the DC Universe at all. So the few times that you see John Constantine or Batman or even Martian Manhunter, you'll be like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot. Taking into consideration that what happens in this series happens in the DC Universe makes the DC Universe even more compelling. It's also great to see things like the House of Mystery and the House of Secrets make an appearance. Also, this series gave us the World's End Inn, which is probs one of my favorite locations in the whole DC Universe. Like, forget the Oblivion Bar, use the World's End Inn instead. It's a pretty rad place, not gonna lie. The Sandman feels like its own carefully crafted mythology. Its lore is incredibly rich with stories and a perspective of all-powerful beings that can outlive gods and universes as long as there's still things to exist. And a part of the series in that lore is how all religions and mythologies are validated through coexistence. 
You'll see characters such as Lucifer and angels as well as Loki, Thor, and Odin. You'll also see that Dream is tied into Greek mythology in that his son is Orpheus who went to Hades to save his loved one. The series shows that all of these beliefs are equally real because there's people there to believe them. And when people stop believing, those beings in those beliefs actually become stories within the realm of the dreaming. The story of the Sandman is a story about stories. The series doesn't just follow Dream on his adventures. A large portion of the series is a bunch of one-off stories and characters telling stories to other characters. A couple of the volumes are actually just collections of these one-off stories. And while yes, you could skip them to focus on the main story, you miss so much rich world building. The universe in which this series takes place feels so much larger and expansive than it otherwise would if the stories were not told. Also, they sometimes plant little things that come back in big ways later on in the series. In Volume 8, The World's End, you have a handful of characters in the end telling stories to each other. And within those stories, characters tell each other stories. It gets pretty Inception pretty quickly. However, the last issue in that volume really propels the story forward quickly as you see that something big is about to go down. And in all honesty, some of my favorite issues in this series come from these symbolic one-off stories. And I can make a video about my favorite stories in The Sandman, but right now we'll talk about the time that Dream commissioned two theater pieces from William Shakespeare. The first of those plays happens to be A Midsummer Night's Dream to which Shakespeare and his theater company performed for Dream and all of his other world buddies that the play is actually based on. It's pretty amazing and easily one of my favorites. Todd Klein is easily the best letterer in the comic book business. The letterer is easily one of the most overlooked aspects of comics. However, Todd makes the fonts and the speech balloons tied specifically to the characters. Of course, not all characters get something that is super unique, but when they do, you easily read the characters in different voices. It really helps bring the character to life and help them feel like they are vastly different from all of the other characters. Couple that with the incredible writing and you have a compelling characters that are unlike any other character you've ever read before. Some people may not feel this about the series and they may think that the one-off stories distract from the main story and slow down the pacing a little bit too much, but I beg to differ. Sure, the pacing is slow at times, but it's part of the journey and I feel like it is necessary for when it is. You could argue that the pacing within each volume is stronger than the pacing of the series as a whole, which is totally valid, but I wouldn't change the order of how I read the series if I were to recommend it to others. I read the 30th anniversary volumes 1 through 11, the novella Dream Hunters, and then the prequel Overture. Even though they recommend reading the Overture first, as the events in that book do take place before the whole series, I find it better to read it after the series. It has a lot going on in it and it could very easily become overwhelming for a new reader. It also contains spoilers for how the whole series ends which takes away from the experience in my opinion. And although the 30th anniversary editions of these books do collect them in a little bit of a different order than what they were originally published in, it actually breaks up the story in a more comprehensive way and it honestly resonated well enough with me that I felt compelled to make this video. This next point is a little complicated for me to explain so please bear with me. The original series started in the late 80s and continued on through the 90s, so the fact that there are characters who are gay, trans, and or characters who cross dress is pretty surprising as a lot of media would reject the idea and still would to this day. They go about it in such a sincere and authentic way. Those characters are in the series because they happen to exist in that world. It feels like they included those characters like they would any other character because they exist. Exist. I think overall I really really enjoy how they tell stories about anyone and everyone regardless of who that anyone and everyone are. They focused on telling the strongest story possible and in that regard I think they were really far ahead of their time. A lot of media, whether it's film, television, comics, or whatever, will use sex, gore, and or violence for shock value, and when it's used in this series, it can be pretty shocking, but the way it's all presented is actually rather tasteful. And when I say that, I don't mean that it isn't graphic or heavily described, I mean that it is used as a storytelling tool that has artistic integrity rather than some cheap shot to get a reaction from the reader. There are moments in the series that get pretty heavy, but it is there with the purpose to draw attention to a character's nature 
teacher, and it's also used as motivation for action by other characters. Where there's action, there's reaction, and that's kind of what the whole series is about. It just happens to be that some of that action is a little graphic. Do you ever get interested in something and then you see how long it is and then you decide not to get into it because it'll consume way too much of your life and then you also find out that it hasn't ended and it'll probably continue on forever and ever? Yeah, that's an issue this series totally avoids. It is pretty long, but it is also digestible. And the fact that from the beginning, everything is building up for a climax and a definite ending that makes for an experience rarely seen in mainstream comics. Because no matter what story or series of story arcs are told, there will always be another issue of Batman or another of Superman. Knowing that's not the case here really makes this feel like a journey you go on and things will change by the end and never go back. And it's also good for readers who are new to comics and are tired of hearing reading recommendations of The Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen, though those are totally valid reading recommendations. As I said before, everything that's mentioned comes back later, and it builds and comes together in a way that gives the series a somber but satisfying ending. And yes, there are spin-offs and other stories told in this universe, but I'm mainly referring to the main run from 1989 to 1996, along with Dream Hunters and Overture. I would also argue that reading Dream Hunters and Overture are not necessary for the main experience, but by the time you read the end of the initial 75 issues, you'll want to, for sure. And if not, that's totally fine. Those stories will always be there to read if or when you want. I find that the Sandman has genuinely changed my outlook on the great expansiveness of the universe and everything that is spirituality for the better. It has helped me approach everything that is religion and mythology and the afterlife with an open mind. It also makes me think a little more about what dreams are and the nature of where our minds go in both sleep and after death. So maybe just the coincidence because I'm reading more or it's the subject matter of the series, but I find that I sleep much more heavily now and dream more vividly. This is a series I cannot recommend enough to readers, both new to comics and ones that have been around for a while. And while yes, it may not be for the faint of heart, it is a monumental step in the comic book industry and, no pun intended, should not be slept on. So this video goes over 10 of many things that I love about the Sandman series, but let me know what your favorite things are about the Sandman series. I'd love to chit chat about it and hear your perspective. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to talk comics with you again.